the importance of content creation and why you should be doing it now. Oh, you don't exist! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In this video, I get to talk with uh, our guest Ivan about content creation. Why is it important and why you should start creating now content uh, using a volume approach. Hello and welcome back. My name is Andre and this is the Code Your Twenties. In this episode, we get to interview and talk to my friend uh, Ivan. And uh, let's start by getting to know a bit more about you, Ivan. All right. Hi, my name is Ivan. Uh, I'm from Thailand originally. I just finished my undergrad, uh, majoring in computer science and chemical engineering. And this fall, I'll be starting a PhD in material science and computer science at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm going to be studying something super niche, computational polymer science, uh, with the hopes of one day inventing something cool and maybe starting a company with it. Uh, in my spare time, I hope to be producing more content, <laughs> which leads us to the topic of today's video. So, let me tell about like what are my thoughts about this thing and then I'm curious to hear you know, what you think about it because uh, we discussed a bit before and Ivan has some super interesting things that he, he adds up and the title like if you don't create content you don't exist it comes mainly from uh, the history because uh, people who didn't create not necessarily content but who didn't create things be it their biography or they didn't actually create something which remained after them, they just remain forgotten into time. And I think the same thing is going to happen to us, like there are infinite people who are interesting and we don't get to hear about them because they are not exposed to the world. And um, I think the entire process of creating content firstly puts your place into the history of the world. Even if it's not an important place, you at least exist there, so there's going to be something which remains. And that can create a personal heritage for you. You can look back. The people you love can look back. And um, it also helps you clarify your thoughts, but you get your place to the history. Um, what do you think about this entire concept of creating content and you know, getting your place to the history? Yeah, so first of all, I want to agree with you on um, several points. Um, I think content creation is very important and history when you look back at the people that we remember in history, it's all the famous inventors, the yeah. leaders, um, the writers. If if you're not the one creating the content, you must have created something, added some value to the world that is your content, in which the way in which we remember you for that one thing. Uh, one thing I do want to clarify with the uh, title is that just because you're not creating content doesn't mean that you don't have, can't, have, can't have a meaningful life. It's just the way that the world will remember you will be through the content you leave behind. So Ivan, I know that you created some content, some actual you know, quality articles, and you shared them with the world. Can you, can you talk a bit about like what are those and what made you yeah. create them? So I wouldn't say I'm a super serious content creator yet, nor am I a, a serial or volume content creator, uh, as uh, I categorize this decoding or 20 uh, YouTube series as. So you, you have ideas in your head, you turn them into videos, and you share them with the world, and as you said, you chronicle them as a heritage for yourself to look back on in the future. Um, the way I approach content creation, or I have been anyway, is as I live my life day to day, I've realized that people ask me the same questions over and over. Like I said, uh, in the previous years, I was a computer science and chemical engineering student in undergrad. Um, one of the most common questions that I got from both friends and strangers alike is that people would reach out to me and say, hey, I know you have experience in switching from chemical engineering to computer science. I know you have a lot of thoughts and topics in this field and expertise. Can you tell me about it? And it, it, I get the same questions over and over. I'm from Thailand. Um, I grew up in Bangkok. Whenever friends come up to me and say, hey, I'm traveling to Bangkok. Can you give me advice on what to visit, what to eat, all this kind of stuff? I get the same questions over and over and I realized that they give the same answers over and over. So I thought, you know, this is something that the world actually wants. This is something valuable that I can contribute to people's lives. Why don't I type this up, make it professional, and uh, share it? Um, these are the only people who are going to be able to access the information that I can give, uh, the, the somewhat unique information I can give, are the people in my social circle who I know. If I put it online, this gives opportunity for more people to benefit from this content. So I guess to summarize, my view on content creation historically has been produce content that will be beneficial to the world. Yeah. But 
those topics yeah. they can be easily seen from the outside so someone looking at you can know that you are from Thailand and you studied computer science and chemical engineer how how can you know if something which is just in your head like some ideas are actually beneficial to the world or not um because I can't know what ideas are in your head yeah. uh, if you don't expose them first. That's a good point. Um, and that's something I've been thinking a lot about recently. And um, my views are starting to change on this topic. Uh, I've, I've written articles uh, of things that I've been passionate about, that I've been thinking of. But I held back on posting them with the thought that, you know, people won't be interested in this. And that has held me back from actually sharing these thoughts and ideas with the world. Just because I put it online, no one's going to care about this, no one's going to read about it. Um, and this may not be the correct way of thinking uh, because I think this is something that we're going to talk about right now, but there is great value in actually putting your thoughts and your articles online and just sharing and producing content. Uh, do you want to share your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, I can share uh, what I see happening with these uh, blogs. And um, the reason why I started is that uh, I wanted uh, to aim for two things. The first one is um, taking like snapshots into some ideas that I have at some point in time because as you advance in life, you start refining and thinking better on that thing. But at this point in time, like even what we speak right now, like this is our thoughts right now. If I there's going to be childish, but it's nice to have uh, snapshots such that other people can see the snapshots and see, oh, but they were like normal kids. And um, the other thing is like just just from the fact that um, we speak in front of a camera and from the fact that we create this content, it refines some ideas which are in our head, which you can't usually refine them if you are on your own, just you know thinking in, in your room it doesn't work that way. And we bounce ideas and we are going to post this video and some someone is going to tell you, oh, hey, Ivan, I saw you in that one. And... Uh, what do you think about this idea? So inputs from the external world are going to come. So I think creating content, even if my first videos were quality-wise not the best, neither the background was cool, not what I was talking was like clear enough, it helped me to improve my English. This is visible from the videos. And, um, you know, get to some other areas. What do you think about yeah, it? I, I, I agree with that. I think uh, life is one big learning experience. Uh, being a guy who's going to probably be stuck in school for a very long time, uh, I really think learning is a very valuable aspect. Um, and the great thing about producing content is I think the act of content production is one of the best ways to learn. And this is something I've realized. Like uh, comparing the articles that I published versus the articles I didn't publish, comparing the videos that you script versus the videos that you actually release, um, you see a great difference in quality. Because yeah. I think in, one, in a sense, the, the act of publishing something online, even if you don't think anyone's realistically going to view it, is forcing yourself yeah. to fine-tune your thoughts, your logics, uh, and uh, make everything just better. Yeah. Uh, and in the act of refining, retuning, redefining, you're absorbing this information you're learning. I think an interesting point that we were talking about earlier was that some of the best thinkers in this world, the most eloquent, well-rationed, uh, you know, people yeah uh, these people are writers these people are content creators because the, the very process of making is learning is absorbing and is clarifying yeah yeah another point that that, that i'm curious to get your thoughts on is um but when you create content everybody has this let's say fear of quality threshold and firstly it's a very subjective what's quality wise but even so, you can feel when something is quality or not. But like, what's the thing that you can do to get to that quality? And how, how can you fight against the fear of quality from what you have seen around? So this is a fear that I definitely personally had. Um, I, I write something, you know, I draw something. And then you're scared of posting it because you think, oh, this isn't going to be good enough. Like, uh, if I post this, I don't want something that's not of high quality associated with my name going on the internet for the world to see. Yeah. Um, you know, this is me, this is my name, and uh, you, quick, you do a quick Google search, you can find everything that's associated with me online. Uh, 
my one of my current beliefs is that there should be a quality threshold below which you don't want those things associated with you. For example, um, I'm sure you guys all have Facebook posts when you were 13, 12, like really absurd stuff from way back then. You went back in time, you deleted those because you know you don't want that kind of stuff associated with your name. Yeah. Um, you, you know, there's like controversial topics that you might not want your future employers to see. Uh, there's lots of recent scandals of people who have like five, ten years of Twitter history. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Like, those those things come back to bite you. So I, I agree that producing for the sake of producing and um, publishing for the sake of learning and publishing is good. But and also it's like the heritage thing. It's very important to have a heritage, and I can see why it's beneficial. But you know, there, there's also a point that could be made that just posting for the sake of posting would could saturate the quality of your posts. Yeah. Could turn off potential people looking at your stuff because they read one article, it turns out to be like you know, crap, and they don't want to read the next one because they're scared of it and they can miss some of the quality you actually release. Um, yeah. So this is the point I'm trying to make. And also, hey, I guess, um, is it always beneficial to have this history? For it depends what you want to put in this history, but having a uh, history of how you time box your thoughts at some point in time, I think it's very interesting because you get some topics which, personally, they might seem new to you as an individual now, and um, you get to think of them now, but then in 10 years, they're going to be so simple topics. Like, if you look back and at how it was to, let's say, get into UC Berkeley, which is one of the top universities in the world, yeah. now when you look back, I believe that it doesn't seem like that hard. Um, but it's <laughs> yeah. But at that point, it was clear like way harder to get it after you got it. I think I think it definitely feels like that's back then. It was definitely like a really really important thing, you know. Yeah. Going into college. Yeah. Versus now, when everyone's kind of in my friend circle is like wrapping up college. Yeah. You know, it's just it was our past. Yeah. It's always on to the next step. Is yeah. I think is what you're saying. What What would you think if you? time box and th this is something that, that that i got advice from someone who finished their phd and uh, they recommended me that the first thing that i do before actually enrolling into one is to write like a two three four pages article on like why do you want to do it now yeah. you time box that and then when you're looking like five years and you finished you actually think hey did i <laughs> Did I actually do what I wanted to do here? Yeah, I mean, we could have a long discussion just specifically on whether or not you want to do a PhD. Yeah. And this is actually one of those questions that I was talking about at the very beginning of this video. People come up to me every day and ask me the same questions. <laughs> whether or not I should do a PhD is one of those questions that I've been yeah. getting a lot recently. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing to note is um, with this whole time boxing thing, uh, there's a graduate student I work with who specifically is on a committee to read the... Uh, so. Most students who go into college have these three, four page uh, essays anyway. They're like your uh, statements of interest, yeah. or personal statements of interest, or five ways of essays. Those are like, they don't have like a hundred percent what you feel inside you. No, no, you're right, you're right. And I guess a more unfiltered version, well, I guess it depends how honest you are. Because I feel like in writing mine, I was pretty honest about what I wanted to do. Okay. But I guess it could always be expanded. Yeah. But, uh, I think the thing is like, um, there's a lot of useful optimism that you can capture these personal statements yeah. that could get jaded after a long five-year PhD. <laughs> so sometimes it's good to just read these youngsters' uh, <laughs> uh, personal statements yeah. to, you know, give yourself some hope, yeah. you know, yeah. after yeah. a long process. Yeah. Oh, what do you think about writing, like, these captures or snapshots? Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's good to reflect on your growth. And, um, yeah, maybe no one in the world is going to care about it, maybe no one's going to see it. But it's good for you to sync to and wrap on how you're developing your learning. Uh, are you reading pieces of content that actual humans create, like regularly? Uh, actual humans meaning not like forks or pieces inside of those publications, but personal blogs? Or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, for me, it's um, articles, yes. Videos, yes. Podcasts, yes. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a lot of quality comes from independent producers, just because it, it may seem more real. Yeah. That might be a totally hard bias in the way I'm viewing large producers versus individual producers. But um, this is just a thing for me with podcasts specifically. Yeah. When 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 you have these big podcasting companies like uh, NHS, yeah. whatever, it, it seems very scripted. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas when you have these two guys just sitting and talking, kind of like we are, yeah. it's just some of the ideas come out of our brain. It comes with more, I guess, unfiltered. Yeah. Uh, and this is another thing we're talking about. Like, we 
talked earlier about a quality filter, where it's like you have an air quality threshold. Uh, I think everyone has their own quality filter, and they, or just filters in general, where they don't want things going through. Uh, you can generalize the custom quality filter to like just a content filter. Uh, yeah, so you're running a lot of it. The quality filter, or just filters in general. I think it's good to have a quality threshold. Yeah. What I don't think it's good to have is have this this quality threshold for like one of the habits that it stops you actually from producing this video. It's like, um, to make this video doesn't have the best sound, you can clearly. Um, I even shoot it with my iPhone so I don't have a camera. Uh, I think this quality is good enough for um, what we are shooting right now. Actually, I have a very good example. So I created a Udemy course, a course on Udemy uh, on algorithms and data structures. And when I posted it, it was the third course in this topic. Now there are over 300. When I created that one, I didn't have even a microphone. So I took some iPhone headsets, I cut it, the actual headset, and I remained with the microphone. So I shoot it out with the microphone. Yeah. I got the course published. Now there are 40,000 students. Fast forward two years, I wanted to produce another course and um, I wanted to be more professional. So I bought a very professional microphone and uh, a Surface Pro, which has the pen because I wanted yeah. to shoot for the quality wise. What happened is that I bought those things and I like, didn't produce the actual yeah. course. So it stopped me from yeah. that. Um, I think this quality. Quality can be measured, the output can be measured, and I think it's a direct correlation between volume and the quality over time. Yeah. So I think it, if it's a good enough quality, like good enough, um, I think it shouldn't stop you from posting. Okay. So how do you determine what's good enough? Going going back to the concept of you have these thoughts in your head, you want to produce them, you want to publish them, yeah. you know, you want to produce content so that you exist. Yeah. Um, how, how do you determine what's good enough, what people will actually care about, or even if people don't care about it, just what's good enough? Yeah, I think something good enough is something that um, you will look pleasure years afterwards, like something which it's interesting to you right now, and you will enjoy looking five years from now on, I think it, it, it reaches the pressure of good enough. What's good enough, it's very subjective. Um, what's good enough research everything is very subject like the volume of research which is never actually used or even like cited by a person is like yeah. huge the standard for good enough is not that high yeah, yeah. well I, I think this bring now that you bring in research is an interesting yeah. topic because research is very much a field in which if you don't produce content you actually don't exist <laughs> like taking the title very literally because researchers are often graded or judged based on how many publications they're releasing, you know? That governs funding, it governs how your respective community. But not just that, it's when you publish, it's not just that you're publishing, it's like, are your words being cited? Do people care about what you do? Um, do you think this carries over, though, to all types of content being produced? Like, what about works of fiction, for example? Fiction is also content, you know? Yeah. Our, our, our discussion of content so far has been limited to the autobiographical, yeah. the, the scientific, the historical generally speaking volume leads to better creation over time um, and um, it's likely to be general in all fields like when someone is a graduate student you start from zero publications and you need to publish a few there is a high likelihood that nobody's ever you know, gonna find something interesting in those like your first publication you are not gonna even something that someone didn't think of it's like your first thing some people are been for much time in the field so it's likely it's not novel but still you, you need to go to, to, the, to this process of publishing so I think it holds also for research and um, when I find somebody interesting I look back on their history and especially now with, with the research it's super easy to look to trace their yeah. publications their first publication is like zero citations yep. um, but they learned something which enabled them to other one so I think we should put volume more on a pedestal alongside quality and not demonize the volume is demonized it's, it's associated with not quality 
which might be true, but in the long run, I think it's a uh, problem. I guess. I, I, yeah, that just makes sense. Do you watch Joe Rogan? Yes. 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 Now it's clearly like one of the top yes. podcast creators, but have you ever looked at like one of his first episodes? Yeah. Quality gets better over time, for sure. <laughs> Quality definitely improves. Um, no, Joe Rogan is the definition of a serial volume producer. Volume. He has over 1,200 podcasts by now. He, he's had almost every notable person in this planet as his guest. Yeah. Um, but he had to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, he had to start somewhere. And, uh, so, is it going? So, uh, you've spoken a lot about the benefits of volume creation. Um, I, I do want to challenge you at one point, which is the potential benefits of maybe holding back on the quantity you're posting. For example, um, let's say I, I'm posting frequently. I'm taking your volume approach and I'm doing daily or even weekly posts, trying to synthesize my experience in certain fields or topics. Uh, and realistically, most of these articles are not going to be very good. Let's yeah. say articles, videos, podcasts, whatever, for media you like. However, let's say I work on an idea really passionately. I take the time to gain experience in it. And I really work on it. And then at the end of the year of experience, I write one killer article that really summarizes everything that I've learned and everything I feel about the topic that I put a lot of love and vision into. And bam, this is the one stellar piece that's really going to change someone's life. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? I think the definitive pieces of content are like the thing that all of us should shoot for. Um, what I think volume gets misinterpreted is like volume doesn't mean to be daily. Volume, like bi-weekly, once every two weeks, it's good enough volume. Even once a month, like 99.9% of people don't produce something once a month other than pictures of them. So the first point, volume doesn't need to be daily, but at least once every two weeks, I think it's good enough. And the other thing with quality, like definitive pieces of content, which actually you can see that they're quality, I think that the framework should be that on, let's say, on a bi-weekly basis, you create a volume approach. So you, you create just, just from the fact of creation. And from time to time, when you synthesize your thoughts more clearly, you, you can create a definitive piece of content. Nothing stops you from that. And um, I think that this is a framework, like on a, let's say, normal basis, you create volume. And from time to time, you create a definitive ones. Because what remains over this time, the bad things get filtered. So everybody's going to see, and you itself, you're going to see only the highlights of those creations. And I think this is clear from history. Like people, like Sigmund Freud, yeah. who is um, like the guy the who guy. invented the new so-called psychology, he has like 30 books. Yeah. If you search... What should I read about Sigmund Freud? Because I did this a few weeks ago. People people suggest you read like two or three. Yeah. All the others remain forgotten at the time, but the process to get those two or three is important. So he also did a volume. volume. So I, I guess one thing you could recommend from this is make sure you're posting in volume, make sure you're learning from the experiences, but don't get caught up in the act of volume production. And from time to time, stop, reflect on what you've done, synthesize and summarize. Yeah. And, and, and you create a quality wise. Yeah. Yeah, because I truly think there's value in putting larger blocks of experience into a certain piece of content. Because I think yeah, the, the the ratio of experience, of life experience and thought you put into something to the article you're producing really makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing which I had a revelation like two months ago. Yeah, and that is that. I don't enjoy, and I assume that nobody enjoys when you are looking for something and you find a bad article and you spend like 10 minutes on that and it's like, oh, why did I enter on this page? The problem is not that that article is bad. The problem is that there is no better article that you can find. So, In fact, you should use this as inspiration. You were looking for this. It didn't exist. Yeah. This is a chance for you to make something better. Yeah. Uh, to be completely real with you, <laughs> when we were thinking of what to make this video on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were brainstorming topics. And the reason we chose this as a topic to talk about <laughs> is when I put into Google, <laughs> if you don't produce content, you don't exist. I got zero search results. <laughs> so, you know, here we are now filling that void. Yeah. So if someone actually looks for this thing, they will find our piece of content because there's nothing which is better than that. So it's not our job to no. 
it's Google's job to find the quality. It's not our job. To find yeah. the and I think I might have interrupted you, but I think where you what you wanted to say was uh, just because someone finds your content bad doesn't mean that your content's bad. It just might not be what they're looking for. Yeah. In which case, it's not you. It's not you that produce bad content. It's the search engine and their uh, you know it uh, algorithms that you know connected them to the wrong piece of information they were looking for. Yeah. yeah. So I went having all this discussion. Uh, articles which you wrote, you kept for yourself. Is there something that you want to change in how you express your thoughts to the world? Yeah, um, I, I think starting from now, I will say it on camera, I am going to increase my content production. Um, one thing I'm still deciding on is the format that I want to choose. Um, you, you should choose something which is also like a I want to say to that is um, I, I really enjoy balanced life and this is I think one thing that um, we, we definitely differ on in which that you don't consume any fiction <laughs> uh, I'm a really fan of balance in my life you know I, I love research I love science I think anyone who talks to you is like I live my life very very scientifically but there's also a part of me that really enjoys just enjoying the other side of life which is for example why I'm considering that one of the mediums that I'm sorry one of the mediums that I'm considering through which to convey my thoughts is through web comics. Web comics. Yeah. Nice. I, I, Are you good at writing? Or I, I want to be better at it. Are you good at drawing? Yeah, I want to be better at it. Oh, nice. Uh, it's something that I enjoy doing. Something I definitely want to get better at. Yeah. So yeah, web comics. Um, yeah, it's kind of left field, but I think it's a medium that I really enjoy consuming and creating. It's not super related to what I want to do professionally. But I think it's good outlet to explore creativity. Get my thoughts out. something common definitely not many people can do it and it's something which you know it catches people's attention like like what the fuck are you doing here you know what i mean yeah. like it, it gets that click um what are the topics that that you might be interested in putting them in web comics so i think it's a good way to share lighthearted daily thoughts because um i think each each medium of expression has associated connotations to it, you know, uh, with articles, they expect something punchy, you know, impactful content, uh, or some kind of reported journalistic, something like that. With um, podcasts, you expect uh, some deep dialogue, in-depth discussion. You know, podcasts are usually more in-depth topics. Uh, you have videos, uh, entertaining. That's, that's, that's a very important thing. Another thing that uh, I want to emphasize is not your content creation doesn't necessarily have to be directly linked to your core career or your core passion. Uh, it's it's I know history will only remember you for one thing, but content creation doesn't just have to be about writing history. It could be a method of expression or a method of uh, you know letting your creative sides come out. For example, just because I'm studying polymer science. Uh, or computer science it doesn't mean that my uh, web comic is going to be about binary or about you know carbon atoms or the splitting of nucleus uh, as some people might assume on the surface uh, it might just be a way for me to you know these ideas I've had in my head these articles I write that aren't published might be a way for me to share these ideas in a less serious way yeah continue so I think we've talked a lot about why creating content is important and uh, why you should be going on doing this. Uh, before we end this video, I think we should talk about the barriers preventing someone such as yourself from creating content yeah. and how to overcome these. Yeah. Where, what do you stand on this? I, uh, I can talk about the barriers I had with the content that I ever produced and why and how I see them now. So I had the barrier of technical equipment, meaning believing that the videos that I produce are not qualitative enough, which is very easy to see. Um, 
I think that that's a bad thing which can stop you because you are not producing Hollywood movies anyway. You are producing something which like 50 people are gonna watch in anyway. And uh, so the technical equipment clearly bad. With a phone you can get everything that, that you want. So that's an excuse which I destroyed now. <laughs> Another excuse which I had was uh, this thing like, you might not speak clearly your thoughts, you might not, not don't know well enough English. If you stop slowly, if you just cut the parts with, where you don't say something clearly, so not expressing your thoughts clearly, it's not an excuse because by time you will get better at it. One thing which people have, and uh, I don't know how to do it, is actually here don't join me exposed to the world, because like stranger are gonna look at you. That thing, I guess, video is probably not the best, but you can get audio or written. So there is actually no excuse if no expressing your thoughts. And another thing is, you might believe you don't have something interesting, but who defines what interesting? Maybe it's not interesting to you, but it might be interesting to someone. And if nobody is, it's not interesting to nobody, you just are not gonna find it. So there is unlimited junk in the world. One more piece of content doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. what, what do you think are uh, some barriers? The, the main barriers for me are simply, uh, will anybody care about this? And what will people think about this? And I think as you mentioned, it's okay if no one cares about it. And it's okay if people don't like what you're producing. As long as it's not offensive, as long as you're not being rude to anyone. The act of creating is, in my view, an act of learning. It's an act of sharing and it's an act of summarizing. These are all important things in growing up, in living, and in documenting, documenting your life. That, that's a good way of trying to finish this video. So Ivan, now that we are wrapping up this video, what's the one thing that you want to let the audience with to think about more and, and remember? Yeah, uh, I think if there's one thing I've learned from this experience of making this video and talking to you about this topic, it's, uh, you know, don't overthink the seriousness of what you're putting into the world and just go ahead and do it. Yeah, who knows what you'll learn from the process. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if you then go back five years to the futures and realize that you absolutely hate what you made, then just think of it as your Facebook timeline from when you were 13 <laughs> and then delete it. The internet is not permanent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Ivan, I uh, definitely enjoyed talking to you and Likewise. I personally got you know new thoughts and things that I'm going to think about and uh, I hope that someone watching is going to find your talk uh, interesting. But at any point, this video is going to fulfill the personal heritage condition. So you, looking back yep. five years from now, is going to... Even next year is going to feel exciting. And um, yeah, thanks for uh, joining uh, Decode Your Twenties. Yep, thank you for having me. I, I hope to have you again. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting point. <laughs>